The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Yes, I'm going to introduce you. Okay, real quick. Um, so, all right. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Rebecca Moreau, and I'm the program director at the Epilepsy Foundation, Texas. I'm here in the Houston office today, and we have our transition program, our tr transition education program for teens ages 12 to 19 and their parents going on today. So we are in a live classroom, and we also have our transition education programs in Dallas and San Antonio joining us today. So hi, everybody. Um, we're glad that you're with us. And so our presenter today is Dr. Rebecca Schultz. She's from Texas Children's Hospital. She's a nurse practitioner there. And um, she is also um, our medical advisor for the grant that um, is part of this, that funds this program. So um, we have been working very hard for the last three years on the transition education program, and she comes with 40 years of experience in the medical field working with children with epilepsy, but also a ton of experience working with um, children in that transition age. And so today, Dr. Schultz is going to be talking about moving on to adult care and what that really takes. And it really does start from 12 years old to get them to that point, you know, at that 18, 19, um, 20 uh, year old age to to move on to that adult health care. So without further ado, I'm going to um, turn it over to Dr. Schultz. Just a couple of housekeeping um, things for people uh, who are watching this. There is a chat um, line on here, and I'm going to point to it. You should have this um, on your screen as well. You can plug into that, and you can um, chat, and I will be the one who will be on the other end. Um, if you have questions, you're more than welcome to put that in the questions um, box or the chat box. And um, I will be sure to ask Dr. Schultz at the end of the session your questions. Um, at the end of this uh, program, there will be an um, evaluation that will pop up on your screen, and we would ask that you would fill that out so um, we can pass that on to our funding source to let them know um, how we did in this session. So without further ado, here is Dr. Schultz. All right, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today and talk to you about uh, transition and moving on to health, um, adult care. So really, what is healthcare tr transition? We've talked some about uh, transitions just in our group here, and so you know we make multiple, multiple transitions throughout our lives, and people talk here about uh, transitioning uh, in terms of their um, youth being and going into puberty, so that's one transition. But you know, we've been in multiple transitions as as children move from kindergarten to you know middle school, et cetera, et cetera. So transitions are uh, a normal part of life. Um, but for healthcare transition, uh, it's defined as a deliberate process, and it really is a process. Um, and it, we hope that it's seamless, and it should be uh, oriented specifically to your youth, um, and so that it's developmentally appropriate and individualized to meet the needs of, of your adolescent, and should be comprehensive as well. We hear, you hear people talk about transfer, and transfer is just one small element, element of that transition process. In the clinic, I often hear some of my colleagues say, oh, gee, you're 18 today. Hmm. Okay, well, we need to be uh, getting you over to the adult care, so uh, today we'll just have you, you know, meet the next time with Dr. So-and-so. And that really is not transition, and that is not what we would like, ideally, to happen with transition. It is a process that takes time. So the goals of transition are to maximize lifelong functioning as well as potential. And again, it takes time because we need to teach uh, self-advocacy skills. We weren't born, none of us were born being you know, a self-advocate. Some of us still aren't very good at being an advocate for themselves. 
And um, it also takes time to teach self-management skills. And for some, it will take more than uh, more time than others. But we really want to prevent this bridge to nowhere, so that you know, as your youth is is moved on to the adult care, there's good communication, so there's not an interruption in their services. We know that successful transition leads to improved continu continuity of care, so there's fewer gaps in, in clinical follow-up because it's a planned process. It's not like, oh, today you're here and tomorrow you're at another um, office. Um, there's all, it also gives you time so that um, you can make plans and so you have improved access to care as you're making that transition and, and later on in the presentation I'll talk a little bit about that and some of you are probably already um, looking into this but there's also uh, changes in, in your financial, well there's specific financial barriers that you may come up across that you know it takes time and you need to plan for those. We also know that successful transition leads to improved adherence. So fewer um, missed medicines uh, for some. If you don't have a good transition, you may find yourself without somebody that's going to prescribe the medicines. And without medicines, then obviously you have your child is at risk for seizures and more um, emergency room visits. So overall, then, um, that we want to improve quality of life for the whole family. Transition has a lot of challenges. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So as I've already said, transition um, you know, occurs throughout our life, but this transition from adolescence to adulthood uh, really is a time where there's increased opportunities for your adolescent, but as they're exploring all of those opportunities, it also puts them at potential increased risk that then can create some angst in us as parents as we you know, this tug back and forth about, well, I want to let him go, but no, I'm not. So, and those are real, uh, you know, real things that we need to deal with. This time can be really rewarding as you see your adolescent making uh, progress and being su successful, but it can also be quite worrisome if they are um, having some problems and some uh, challenges and. Um, some failures. I mean, we're all have faced failures in our life, but that's hard to watch your your adolescent fail. Um, for adolescents who have some intellectual disabilities, their increased body size, and then as they they're growing, their increased body size, it just makes that gap more apparent. So as a parent, sometimes then you may have to start uh, readjusting what your expectations were for your child and think about, well, are those really realistic or do we need to make some changes? So there's a barrage of challenges for both you as parents as well as for your youth during this time. Relationships during transition. Think about when you were an adolescent. I really, I don't want to go back to that time myself. <laughs> it wasn't my most favorite time in life. But, uh, you know, I think that uh, perhaps uh, some of you can, uh, can identify with this picture here. Is he listening? And, you know, you're youth over there, blah, blah, blah. I think I probably, uh, I can kind of remember doing that to my mother. Um, <laughs> and I really like this one here. So, um, you know, how many times have we maybe heard from our youth, oh, mom or dad, you just really don't understand. And I like this cartoon here. It's a little bit difficult to, to uh, read, but it says, it's you who doesn't understand me. I've been 15, but you've never been 48. So, you know, sometimes we feel like we need a survival guide to get through this time uh, of adolescence. But I think if you think back to, to when your child was a baby, you might have thought back then, gee, nobody ever told me how to do this, and you all made it through. So you'll make it through. Um, and, you know, hopefully attending some seminars like this can give you a few tips. It's a difficult time for teenagers. They're looking at, you know, they want that autonomy, but yet they don't. So, you know, they're pushing you away at one time, and, on the, and yet at another time they want to cuddle up and they need all of your support. And so sometimes it's difficult to uh, to do family activities. Come in. So the needs of, of adolescents with epilepsy are really similar to the uh, needs of other youth who have chronic health conditions. 
um, all youth transition to adult health, uh, adult care, and doctors um, as they enter adulthood. Um, all of the needs for adolescents change as they mature. They, everyone has a desire for independence, and everybody wants this. Uh, has a need for identity and a purpose in life. But for some with epilepsy, it may be easy. Others, it can be very complex, and it really does require individualized care. It's not going to be the same for, for everyone. And you know, if you have other other children, it may very well be different for you know between ch children because everybody is different. We look at this from a developmental uh, perspective and take into account the tasks of adolescents. Um, Eric Erickson is a psychoanalyst who looked at this um, at time of development in adolescence from age, he defined it as age 12 to 18. And, um, you know, this is really a time of role confusion and identity is how he um, defines this. So, again, everybody wants this autonomy, and uh, but developing an identity, both a personal identity as well as sexual identity, are really some of the two of the major tasks of adolescence. You know, everybody wants to be somebody <laughs> someday. Um, it's a time of developing goals, both vocational as well as educational. And um, it's uh, fidelity is is also a um, important virtue to develop during this time. So. Um, you know, it can be, again, challenging as you uh, guide or watch your adolescent um, through developing intimate relationships. The camp fields are from um, Canada, and they've done a lot of research on looking at the impact of epilepsy on adolescent maturation and on these tasks of, of um, adolescence. So these are some actual quotes that um, they that they got from adolescents when they were asking them about how they felt in terms of what how epilepsy was impacting their life. So in terms of autonomy, one of the adolescents said, "Think of the things that I can no longer do without supervision: take a bath, swim, stay up late, drink beer." So as we think back to our adolescence, you know, we may have had more autonomy in some areas than another. But you know, for simple things like taking a bath or swimming, you know, that might have been something that our parents, you know, were free to go do that. And nobody ever worried about. But as parents of a child with epilepsy, all those common things become very worrisome to us. And how do we let go? Body image. One adolescent said, "The pills will make me fat. My hair will fall out." Well, we all know how important body image is to us today, let alone as an adolescent who's struggling with, "Who am I?" You know, who am I? You know, my peers are important. I don't like them. And so it makes it a challenge. Peer group identity. No one will go on a date with me. What happens if I have a seizure at school and wet my pants? I mean, these are real concerns for these kids. They may not verbalize that to you, but these are quotes, again, from adolescents who have epilepsy and some of the things that they deal with and think about. Um, there was a study done now back in 2001, but unfortunately I think things haven't changed a whole lot in our world in terms of what some people in society, how some people in society view, view epilepsy. And so in that study, there about 50%, 50% of adolescents said they wouldn't date someone who had epilepsy because they thought, some people thought that it was contagious. And, um, you know, it was probably really more a lot of fear and lack of knowledge. So, you know, that's one of, I see that as one of my challenges to help educate the community about the real issues with epilepsy so that we can help our adolescents with these um, issues. Identity. I'm not supposed to do most of the things that my friends do. Drinking, drugs, sex. So these are all things that we need to, to talk about, difficult topics to talk about with a normal, a, an adolescent that doesn't have a, a chronic health condition, but someone who has epilepsy, and we know that drugs and alcohol can definitely lower seizure threshold, and um, they're real, you know, and having sex, many of the medications um, affect 
birth control, the effectiveness of birth control pills. So issues that are difficult to talk about, but issues that are absolutely necessary to talk about with your youth. Those adolescents who have cognitive impairments, uh, studies have shown that um, you know, their cognitive ability does um, affect their transition, but they have also shown that those adolescents who have been able to develop independent living skills can successfully transition, and this is talking about not just um, medical healthcare transition, but really transition into uh, to life, to live independently in a home, in, a, in their own home or school, etc. But they often need just a little bit of additional support. But again, something to not hold back and uh, for your youth and let them do as much as they can. These studies have also shown, so if you're uh, a parent that's in this situation and have a child who, or an adolescent who has some cognitive impairments, unfortunately, um, it's sometimes difficult to find an adult provider who feels comfortable taking care of an adolescent who has epilepsy as well as intellectual uh, disabilities. So it may take you a little bit longer to find someone. So again, this is a process, takes time, and we need to plan for it. The spectrum of epilepsy, and we've talked here in the Houston group kind of about, you know, went around the table and shared um, our experiences with epilepsy, and I don't know, hopefully, perhaps you did that uh, at the other two sites. But we know that um, epilepsy is fairly diverse. So you can have epilepsy that um, it, that's well controlled. We know that 60% of people who have epilepsy, their seizures are well controlled with medicine. But there are about 40% of people who continue to have multiple seizures despite adequate doses of medication. So epilepsy can go all the way from being uncompromised and really not having any impact on your life all the way down to being um, significant or strongly compromised. Factors that influence that are your epilepsy itself, um, underlying neurological status, uh, and what I mean by that is, so what was the underlying cause of your epilepsy? Perhaps it was due to a stroke, so you may have some additional comorbidities or um, other conditions related that, that actually caused your epilepsy, but you may have more than one condition that you're dealing with. And then the effects of therapy. There are multiple possible side effects from uh, seizure medicines, so how do we best um, and most effectively um, have the least amount of side effects, but the best control for seizures. But all of these things play a role in epilepsy itself and then on the transition process. So transition takes time. It takes you time to locate resources. It takes time for you to learn new information, but it also takes time for your adolescent to, for you to teach or for your adolescent to learn new information. So it, um, it's best to start early, and I always say you can't start too early. The American Academy of Pediatrics with their transition program recommends starting at 14, but I personally in my office may start some kids, you know, and you might think, well, that's not really transition, but it's all learning about self-management skills. So if they're seven or eight and they are, you know, able to talk and know their medicines, I start out simple. What medicines do you take? Well. Some of them know, but most of them don't. Well, what color is it? So start simple. Just what color or how many pills did you take? And then you can build on that knowledge. Transition takes advocacy. Um, and I'm preaching to the choir here. You all know that. You've been doing this for a while. And tenacity. And I put the hearty toll bridge here because, you know, that's a long time. For, so, so, for some people, it, this may be a long process, and for others, it may be a little bit shorter. So this transition process um, is divided into various uh, portions. So it's all about discovering, starting with discovering, tracking, then preparing, uh, down to planning, transferring, and completing. And, um, this is the process that's outlined by the GOT Transition uh, group, and um, this is a good website to go to for lots and lots of information uh, about transition. They have uh, various uh, handouts, and actually I was supposed to have handed these out. So 
I don't, I'm assuming that you off-site have these things, so um, I'm going to just pass these around there. I'll get to them, but um, you can have them. So discovery. Look in your uh, pediatrician's office. Do they have a policy about transition? Have you ever seen one? We talk about transition in our office a lot, or some of us do. But we don't have a transition policy posted. But that's recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics. So even if it's not posted, that, that's fine. Then keep you from asking your provider, how long are you going to see my adolescent in your practice? You know, is it going to be 18? Is it going to be 21? Maybe they never will uh, make you leave. Maybe you can always go there. It really varies from one provider to another and one institution to another. So for you to be able to get prepared and start early, it's important to find out how long can I stay here. That gives you an idea of how much work you have to do and what kind of what time period. And what are they going to do to help you with that process? Are they just going to say, oh, well, you need to go find a new provider? Or are they going to give you some names and references uh, so that you can help find or so that you can find somebody? And then tracking. How can you track your health information? So a lot of you, most of the parents that I come across in, in my clinic, you know, you're already tracking your health information, at least in terms of um, appointments and maybe medication uh, refill reminders. And you can do that on a calendar, paper and pencil. Some people are old school like me. I still like paper and pencil because all of this newfangled technology, you know, that breaks down. Uh, <laughs> it might not work, but, you know, it's whatever works for you. Um, there are many uh, seizure tracker apps that um, you can actually track seizures, and I have a couple of them uh, listed on my next slide. So uh, some parents are finding that that's easier rather than tracking seizures on the calendar and bringing that to the office. Uh, put a seizure, get a seizure tracker app and download it on the phone. That may be something you want your adolescent to do. Maybe you want them to encourage them to start taking a little bit more charge of their health. I mean, think about it. You're not with them the whole day they're at school. So you're going to miss out on all of that. And so, you know, they can start tracking that. That gets them prepared for when we let them go uh, and so that they can start taking responsibility for uh, their health. Are they going to make some mistakes and miss some? Yeah, but we do too. So, um, you know, get them started. What should you bring to your appointments, list of questions, health insurance information, and I encourage you to engage your adolescent in all this stuff. You know, so often I think that we, yes, um, or and I can, you know, speak to this myself. I'm the one that's in charge when I take my my kiddos to the doctor. You know, I'm the one that's written down all those questions, and I'm taking care of everything. And but I encourage you to engage your adolescent in that, or your you know, you know your child in, in that because uh, then they can be my off camera. <laughs> I like to be able to see. I can't see her, so I can move you. <laughs> sorry, um, sorry for all you folks out there that I'm off camera for you. Um, anyway, so you know you can help your child by role modeling that and encouraging them. Ask them what questions they want to ask, and then have them write them down and have them ask the healthcare provider instead of you always asking the healthcare provider uh, what the questions are. And uh, get them used to taking their health insurance information uh, or knowing what it is that you give the person at the counter when you check in. It's all, you know, again, role modeling and uh, helping them to take that responsibility. Here are a few examples of seizure diaries and medication reminders. You can use your own smartphone alarm and calendar for uh, medications. I encourage a lot of my adolescents to, you know, they need to start learning about taking their own medications and being responsible for that. So how can they do that? Um, I'm horrible at taking medicines. I can't remember to take medicines. So, you know, maybe they can put an alarm on their smartphone so that uh, it alarms and reminds them, oh, it's time to take my medicine now. Um, there's this uh, medication reminder called texting for control. 
that um, is good that you can download and it uh, can give you reminders. Other applications, there's a My Seizure Diary, there's multiple seizure tracker apps. You can just go out there and look. These are just a few of them. E-Action from UCB Pharma, MyEpilepsy.com, there's Medication Reminder Text, and um, there's uh, seizure videos that you can also upload. So here's just an example of My Epilepsy uh, Diary that um, you know, you can download and take a look at that. Again, you need to find one that works for you. What works for me not, not, might not work for you. So find one that works for you, or more importantly, what's going to work for your adolescent because we're going to, you're trying to help them make this, uh, learn these self-management skills and move on. Here's a screenshot of the texting for control so you can see that you can put in your med the medications and the dose and uh, reminders that they'll uh, get sent and that sort of thing. There's uh, where you can uh, also record seizures. Mm -hmm. And some of these apps you can also then, then they also uh, will actually put this all in a graph so you have a nice graph if you're into all those details. So I have some uh, usually engineering dads that come in with these nice long graphs and they can tell you how many and at what time, which, you know, we laugh or I'm kind of making, not really making fun of that, but I really like that. You think, oh, well, that's kind of overkill. <laughs> well, I always say I can talk about engineers because I'm married to one, okay? <laughs> and I give him all sorts of great. <laughs> so, uh, you know, his precise writing, no, we won't get into all that. So, um, but anyway, actually you might think, well, that's overkill. But actually, as I'm looking at, um, well, I take care of a lot of um, children on the ketogenic diet, so I'm always looking at when are the seizures and, you know, what was going on at that time, Or, but even with medicines. Do you see a particular time of day that, that you're seeing more seizures? Well, what's going on at that time? Maybe I need to adjust the dose of medicine, if possible. So all that detail can be helpful. So, um, you know, but for some people, detail is uh, not their forte and they can't do all that. But And that's okay. Just the number you have, just tracking a number and having a general idea. Well, I see more when they wake up in the morning or as they're going to sleep or at night. Um, all that information is helpful to us as providers as we're trying to find the best, get the seizures under the best control. Other ways to track, um, I have uh, several families that have a binder and I think that's helpful, particularly for people who have been dealing with the, uh, with epilepsy, say, for since your child was four. You might not have started keeping track of all of that stuff early <laughs> on, but now as you're thinking about moving on to the adult health care, um, uh, providers, you know, you might start thinking about, oh, well, at least collecting the last year or so's worth of EEGs, MRIs, put those in a binder, ask your health care provider for copies of them so you can have them. Yeah, you can always get them from the hospital, but sometimes that's uh, not as easy as uh, easily done as, as said. So, you know, get your own copies, keep your own uh, binder with all of that information. You may, I have several moms that um, have a binder and they have their um, uh, business cards for all of their physicians tucked in there. So, you know, if you have a lot of different physicians, it's hard to remember who, where, who they are, what numbers, and all that sort of stuff. So it's a good way, all your therapists, you know, what's the pharmacy? Again, that's role modeling, a, a possible way to role model to your youth about how they might keep track of their healthcare information as they move off to college or, or wherever they're going to go when they move out of the house. You can have your emergency care plan in there. So if you're gone and you have a, a you know, they're staying with friends or, or uh, other family members, they know what your emergency care plan is. When do you give diastat? Do you give diastat? What about using the BNS magnet? How does this all work? And when do I really need to take uh, go to the emergency room. And so all of that information, if it's in a binder, because unfortunately in today's world, but I guess any time, but in today's world, you never know what's going to happen to you. 
So if you've got all that information stored, but you haven't shared that or don't have it written down, what happens when you're, you got sick or you did something uh, happened and, and you're not able to communicate that information? At least it's written somewhere so you don't hopefully have as many gaps in care. Here are several resources that I pulled together and there's some um, others out there. Again, uh, gottransition.org has uh, some, is that one of them that I handed out? Anyway, I don't know that it is. I think this is on transition skills. But this is a website, but that's the mm -hmm. list of transition. They have on that website, uh, and you can go there and download it, they have a medical summary that you can put together if you're interested in doing that. They have a template for an emergency care plan. Again, it needs to be something that's going to work for you. Texas Parent to Parent uh, Care Notebook, they have a nice, um, you can go to their website, they actually have a, a, a CD, and I think someone from that um, uh, place came and uh, spoke last time, so you probably know some about that. But if you missed that one, there's the website, you can go to that and, and uh, explore it. They have lots of good information um, on that website. And then Sick Kids in uh, Toronto, Canada actually has this website that you can go on and you can change your, you can print like a passport, a healthcare passport. And um, it may, that's something you can do with your adolescent, help them fill in all the blanks. That's a way to teach them about well, what kind of seizures do I have, what medicines maybe I've taken in the past, make sure they know what medicines they're on. So again, it's a, a, a tool that you could potentially use to help your youth um, learn about their health and take some charge for their own health care. So the next phase is, is preparing, learning to manage. So again, start early. I always say, again, it's never too early to start. Um, definitely, I encourage you to get started by 14. That really kind of also fits with the time in school that your schools are typically starting to think about transition from an educational standpoint and looking about what is your youth going to do um, in the future. So 14 is kind of the magic number that, the, again, the American Academy of Pediatrics has put out, but I think that you can start earlier depend upon, depending upon um, the abilities of your child. Like I said earlier, just knowing what color of the medicine it is and how many times they take it a day and you can build on that. I oftentimes give my um, youth and adolescents an uh, assignment. Of course, they're like, an assignment? Oh, no. But anyway, an assignment. So, you know, I see kids every three to six months, so you have a long time to learn this. Next time, just come in and be able to tell me what color your medicines are, or tell me the name of one of your medicines, and then, you know, we build on that. And so, it's amazing. You start it, break it down in little steps like that, rather than you always being the one that's giving all that information, it, it helps them learn. Uh, one mom suggested aligning it with the training and independent living skills that you all do for all other aspects of your uh, youth's life, and then advance with age acquisition. Baby steps, and it starts with you. Think about letting them check in for their clinic appointment. How many of you just walk in and you go up, you sign in, you give the insurance card? Maybe next time let your youth, well, of course you need to prepare ahead of time, but let them sign in and you go sit down and look at the magazine rather than, than them going and sitting down and looking at their phone or whatever. And, you know, you're there. You can, you can fill in and be their backup, but let them start taking those little steps and take charge. You might be surprised what they can do. <clears throat> So Eileen Forlenza is a uh, mother with a child with special health care needs, and she really talks about this time as, as moving from the ad, an advocate to an ally, which it really is. You've been advocating for your children for since the day they were born, but maybe not about their health care, but you've been advocating for them for school and all sorts of things. So um, you're really, though, moving from that role of advocate to being their ally you're there for support and to support them, but you're letting them start to make some of the decisions. But wow, isn't that hard? How do we let our children go? And you know, we talked about that a little bit earlier. It's hard enough with your with youth that don't have any health conditions. And for something like epilepsy, we talked here a little bit before the meeting started. You know how it's 
seems I think it I really think it's harder perhaps to let go for with children that have epilepsy because it is so unpredictable. And I think it's harder than say perhaps if you have asthma or diabetes. Um, so, you know, again, it's not easy, but here are some tips. Remember, it's about your child. It's not all about you, so you have to start letting go. And let go of the idea that your child will make the same choices as you did for them. I mean, think about when you were an adolescent. Did you always make the same choices as mom and dad wanted? Probably not, but it's okay most of the time. I mean, you know, everybody's going to make mistakes along the way, but that's how we learn. We as professionals need to let go, too. So oftentimes, partly because of time and a number of uh, other reasons, but, you know, we speak to the parent in the room. That's the quick and easy way to do it because, you know, you ask the adolescent, they may not answer, they look the other way, it's like, what, you know, but so it's a little bit harder to pull that out of them, but encourage them to, to communicate. And like I said earlier is, you know, if the healthcare provider asks, you a question, turn your child and have them or your youth and have them answer. Um, and you might practice that before as you're coming to the office, a point, the clinic appointment. Remember, you know, Johnny, what was it that you were going to ask? And I'm going to let you ask that. Um, and letting go, obviously, is going to look different for each of us. It's never too early. Can't say that enough. You need to uh, educate your, your uh, teenager about their condition, so signs of illness, uh, rather than you always being the one that, oh, I think you're getting sick, or, oh, did you, you know, whatever. You need to educate them to be aware of their illness and what to start doing about it. Um, sex, drugs, and alcohol, all those hard things to talk about, but very important for uh, your youth with epilepsy. Signs of an emergency and when they really need to start seeking medical attention and help them develop an emergency plan. And then, do you have ICE programmed on your phone? I think that for some of us, that that may be something that might be a little bit of um, help as you're dealing with, oh, do I, do I let her go to the movies? What happens? You know, if ICE is programmed in their phone, then, um, you know, maybe that'll help you feel a little bit more comfortable with letting go. Perhaps they, uh, you want to get a medical alert bracelet, necklace, or tag. That can, that can be one way to uh, communicate the emergency plan. Put a, a, develop a wallet card so it has their diagnosis, their medication, so that if you're not available and they get taken to the ER, somebody can find that and know what their diagnosis is, what their meds they're on. And particularly if your youth is moving off to college, they need all of this stuff because you're not going to be there with them. And ice. So, um, some you can find ice on on uh, locked phones, and there's a you can go there's an app for this, so you can go and, and look at this and explore this. Uh, so it's easy to find. Managing medicines. So I, we all know that missing a medicine is one of the num is the number one reason for breakthrough seizures. So um, it's very important to help your youth learn how to manage their medicines and be, take responsibility for taking it on time and um, also knowing what the side effects are for it, encouraging them to ask their healthcare provider about um, or talk to them about if they don't feel good on the medicine. Just don't take that for granted and say, I have to feel like this. I mean, there may be things that we can do to adjust doses or the timing of the dose so that uh, your youth can feel feel better. But if, tell us we don't know that uh, and can't help. <clears throat> and uh, help them learn how to refill prescriptions. Again, you can they can start doing that early on. And so that that's something that they, that's just part of what they do and have been doing for a number of years when they're ready to move out of the house. They need to know how to schedule an appointment. And these are things that are actually on that transition uh, check. They have these at the other sites too. I will send it to them. Okay, I'll have it Okay, so all of you off-site, we have uh, a checklist for transition um, uh, skills, but uh, we'll get those to you after the presentation. So um, things that they need to know how to do when they uh, 
get over to the adult world is how to schedule an appointment. They need to know the importance of keeping track of their labs, calling to follow up on what their lab results are, EEG results, etc. What kind of insurance coverage do they have? And what happens if they lose it? What are you going to do? What are the resources out there? And as a parent and moving, uh, as your adolescent is moving over to adulthood, you know, there's lots of insurance changes that occur during this period as well. So those are things that you may want to look at ahead of time so that you can be prepared and not get caught off guard. I've already talked some about this, but promoting independence, so encouraging your adolescent to participate in a clinic visit. Uh, let them ask or tell about their seizures and how they're feeling. Um, encourage them to ask questions. And last uh, point there, time alone in the clinic visit. So, you know, until they're 18, you're obviously going to need to be there to give consent and sign them in and that sort of thing, or give their that consent. But that doesn't mean you have to go back to the office with them. You know, you might go back there initially and then excuse yourself and come back in at the very end so that you can get the, so you know what the plan was because you need to leave there with the plan and your adolescent might or might not tell you that. But, you know, encourage them to maybe have some time alone in the clinic because we all know our adolescents probably might not ask all the same questions with us in the room as they would uh, when you're not in the room. And again, that helps them uh, develop some advocacy skills and promotes their independence. It's really important to instill hope for future autonomy. That's one of the things that I hear from the youth is that, you know, they feel kind of hopeless and think, well, I'm never going to be able to leave the house. My mom always does this or my dad always does that. I'm never going to be able to leave. And, you know, that's really kind of sad and depressing. So instill that hope for them for the future. Um, Maybe it's not what you dreamed of or what they really dreamed of, but everybody needs a dream to, to strive for. Encourage them to participate in camp programs and after-school activities so that they can develop those self-advocacy skills. They have a seizure in front of their friends. You know, it's not the end of the world. If they, you know, help them learn how to share and talk about their seizures with their friends so that their friends know what to do and everybody's safe. And so you had a seizure and you pick up and go on. Discuss plans for their education and vocation. You know, what do they really want to do with their life? Going off to college isn't for everybody. So, and that's okay. Not everybody needs to go to college. But most people want to have a job someday. So what can they do? There's tons of different jobs that they can do. Um, and so help your, your youth think about and find a, a vocation or a job that they're able to do, successfully do. And, um, and so that they have hope for the future. Here's that skills checklist. I, those are just a few of the things that are on that, that checklist. So these, again, are things that your youth should know by the time that they are ready at 18 or 21 to move over to the adult world. Um, and so you can use that checklist in however way you want. You might use it to ask your, your adolescent, do, you know, do they already know all this stuff? So maybe they they have already acquired all these skills, but it knows, lets you know where the gaps are and things that you can work on over these over this time from 14 to 18. It's really um, there's lots of differences between the pediatric and the adult healthcare model. Not too surprising if you stop and think about it a minute. But you know, as we as adults go to our our appointments. You know, it's boom, 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 you walk in, what do you want, what are you here for, okay, and you're out the door. We're a little bit different in, in pediatric world, as you know, we tend to take, I think, a little bit more time, and, you know, it's not rapid-fire questions and tell me the answers and you're out the door. Maybe, but, you know, I think oftentimes we're a little bit more family-focused and asking a little bit more about, um, how your epilepsy, how the epilepsy may be impacting your family, what can we do? Many pediatric offices have social workers, nurses um, that are skilled and um, trained in epilepsy, whereas you might not find that in the adult world, particularly social workers. Um, and that appointment for your youth, well, once you move over to the adult world, it's all about that 
that child or that youth, or child, that adolescent, that young adult. Whereas before, again, it was more about the family. Changes in roles. So at this point now, it's the youth or the adolescent young adult that's the decision maker, not you. They're over 18. So um, again, it's that moving from being the advocate to being the ally. You can still be there as the support person, but it's really your youth that are making the decisions, and they need to be able to talk about their needs and their concerns. As we get ready for adult uh, health care, there are legal changes that occur. As probably everyone knows, the age of majority in the state of Texas is 18. In most states it is. There are a few states that it's 19 or 21. But in Texas it's 18. Uh, so at that point in time, irrespective of what their intellectual abilities are, your child is considered an adult and has the right and responsibility to make legal decisions, including their health care decisions. So even if they, you know, are cognitively um, totally, um, you know, straight A student and, and um, intellectually intact, all the way down to uh, being totally dependent on on you for care, at 18 they become an adult and can make decisions according to society. How do you think of Pardon me. How do you Right. So the question was, is that it? How do you take care of that or approach that if your adolescent maybe wants to do that, but you know that intellectually they're not capable of doing that? So that speaks to my next point here. So those capacities going to uh, vary from from uh, one adolescent to another. So there are several different. Uh, options along that pathway. So you may have some shared decision making, so you may just have some confidentiality wa waivers so that you still have access to care. Because technically, again, once they turn 18, you don't even have the right to their medical records. And so it might just be that, that you just really want the right to their medical records. And so you might do some confidentiality wa uh, waivers. Um, some people will do uh, healthcare power of attorneys so that maybe they're independent in many other areas of their life, but for their health care, you really don't feel like that they're capable of making those in decisions independently, all the way to guardianship. And guardianship can be partial guardianship or can be full guardianship. And again, that depends upon um, the level of ability of your youth and uh, in what areas of their life you think that they're capable of making decisions. You want them to be, you know, as you want to give them as many options and as much freedom and an autonomy as possible, but you also want them to be safe and for society. So those are all things that take time. You can't. Um, you know, get guardianship or shared decision making until they're 18. But those are things that it takes time to prepare for and to think about. And you know, you may want to talk to your uh, physician. You may want to talk to the school. When I'm looking at guardianship forms, because uh, I take, take care of many youth who have uh, significant intellectual uh, disabilities, so sometimes I'll get um, the testing from the school, or maybe they've had neuropsych testing as sometime during their epilepsy workup so that you really know what their strengths and weaknesses are. Um, and uh, Because again, you want to give them as much autonomy as possible, but you want to keep them safe. So there's lots of work to do with that and lots of consideration to take into account for that. Guardianship, and I can't speak to the shared decision making and that um, cost for them. I think those are less, uh, but I don't really know what those costs. Guardianship, what I've learned from parents, uh, whether you're doing partial or full guardianship, depending upon, and you can do this on your own, but many people will get an attorney to help with that, um, and it can cost, depending upon your attorney, anywhere from $2,000 to $5,000. So again, most of us don't have that kind of money in our hip pocket to pull out. So uh, it takes some time to save and, and think and plan ahead for those for that time. There are some resources available because that again that's expensive. So you could ask your social worker um, at a hospital or epilepsy foundation. 
here also has some um, resources that you can get some free advice for guardianship uh, through an attorney. So there are some resources out there uh, that you can get um, some assistance from a financial standpoint for that. Here are some other resources on guardianship and decision making alternatives. Uh, put those up there so that, again, it takes a lot of thought and, and uh, time to figure out what's best for you and your family. So I uh, wanted you to have access to that. And I think Rebecca said uh, beforehand that um, these slides will be made available to you so that you can uh, peruse those websites if, you're, if they're of interest to you. So providing, um, finding a new provider, as I said, you can ask, you should be asking early on when your current healthcare provider is going to move you on the other side of the world uh, to the adult healthcare. Perhaps they'll give you a referral. That's what I usually do, but that's not what everybody does. Um, friends and family um, are sometimes good resources. Also now, um, even if I give you a referral, that person might not be on your health insurance. And so that's another good place to start. And that's what our social worker often asks is, well, look at your, uh, the providers that are covered by your insurance and then come talk to me and we'll, we'll help you find somebody. As you're thinking about finding that adult health care provider, think about what your needs and your expectations are. Does this, do you want somebody that's close to the house? Or if your adolescent is moving off to college, maybe it makes more sense that they have an adult health care provider that's closer to college because that's where they're going to be. Um, so, and what their transportation needs are. If their seizures are well controlled, maybe transportation isn't an issue. But if they aren't, then they're not driving. So you need to think about how are they going to get to that health care provider. So again, time to figure out all those issues. What hospital are they is that provider affiliated with um, for their emergency care? That, and that's one thing as I talk to families about transition, and I'm sure it varies, I know it varies from institution to institution, but again, I take care of many youth that see multiple different subspecialists. So you, would, you might think within one institution we would have one set policy, but we haven't gotten there yet. So I often ask, well, when is GI going to transition you? When is orthopedics going to transition you? Because, you know, sometimes I can, I have some wiggle room that I don't have to send you on your way at 18. I may be able to hold off until you're 21. You may want to do that. You may want to have that as a piecemeal so that not everything with your adolescent's health care is getting moved over at one time. You might want to have a little bit more piecemeal. So again, I try to work with, with families to say, what is best for you? Um, one of the challenges I think about if you're not all moved at one time is that, okay, well, my epilepsy is at the adult provider, and they're, so if they have problems with their epilepsy, they're going to go to, say, St. Luke's. But if they have a GI problem and my that provider is still at Texas Children's, then they're going to go to Texas Children's. So you have issues as if your child has multiple uh, specialties and really how can you best get this all packaged together so that it works for you. Um, things to think about for your new provider, how important it is, is, that, is it to you that they are the expert in epilepsy? Because sometimes that can be a challenge. Uh, depending on where you live and where your um, adolescent is going. Or is it more important that you're going to find an adult provider that may have a few gaps in the knowledge, but you guys are good at, at educating us. I know that. And so, you know, maybe you find somebody that maybe doesn't know quite everything, but you feel pretty comfortable in educating them, but they're going to be a person that you feel comfortable communicating with and it's going to take time. So again, everybody's going to have a little bit different need and it takes time to sometimes find the right person. And if you get transitioned to an adult provider, you may find out initially thinking that, that oh, this is going to be great. You may find out, oh, this is not a good fit. So you may need to find, just as you maybe have shopped around for pediatric providers, you may find yourself shopping around for um, an adult provider. 
I have a question. Yes. So like, um, my daughter's an neurologist, and she, I asked, because she's 19, and so I asked her, can you still keep her? She goes, oh yeah, I'll keep her, so that's fine. So when, and I don't know anything about insurance, do you know there's a difference between pediatric and adult? I mean, they can take, uh, take her on as long as the doctor says it's okay. You'd have to look at that, um, that clinic's policy or hospital's uh -huh. policy and if and if your insurance changes because sometimes the uh, you know different hospitals will accept different um, insurance policies um, or Medicaid versus Medicare that's where you really start getting into oh I don't accept that help you know I don't accept Medicare or I don't accept Medicaid and that's what your your adolescent has so that's where I see some of the bigger issues the provider may be willing to take care mm -hmm. of her him or her, but if the insurance changes to some, you know, one that they that the institution doesn't accept, then you're going to have potential problems. Which I just talked about. <laughs> insurance coverage will change. It it may or may not. Uh, some will be able to stay under their parents' plan until they're 26. Medicaid will it change? Oftentimes it does, but not always. There's different Medicaid plans, and some are um, have less access, less. Um, I guess I'll just say that less access to care or less variability in where you can go. Uh, chip in coverage ends after the 18th birthday, so if you have chip now, um, that's something that you will probably want to consider about. You know what's going to take the What's going to fill that gap when it's gone? Other places for assistance is the Social Security Administration and then um, healthcare.gov. Go into college. So you're not brave enough to let your youth go off to college outside of your city. And they're going to stay in the dorm, perhaps, or in an apartment with somebody. So it's really important to think about that ahead of time and check out the Student Health Center on the college campus. Every college campus has a Student Health Center. You need to get to know them. And so that if your adolescent or your young adult has a seizure or other health problems while they're on the, the Student Health Center knows who they are and knows about them. That's where you can take, you know, that's where your binder of all this information that you've been gathering comes in, in important. You can take it, you can share some of that with them, and so that you can develop a plan for them while they're away at college. And hopefully that's going to um, be a little bit less nerve-wracking. It'll be a little bit less worried uh, while they're gone. Develop an emergency plan. Share that with their roommate or with their resident advisor. Uh, even if they've been seizure-free for, you know, three years. We all know that seizures are unpredictable and you could have one. So I think it's important, again, to talk about it, share that with the roommates so that the roommates aren't freaked out or scared when that happens. Medical alert bracelet or, again, ice, other things, to uh, ways to, uh, so that other people can know what's the emergency care plan for your youth. Uh, they graduate, then what? Maybe they're going off to college. Maybe college isn't on their roadmap. So what are they going to do? Is there a vocation that they can, that they want to um, work, engage in? Uh, the ARC has lots of information. Family Voices is a good um, resource. Texas Parent to Parent I've already talked about. Families can, and I apologize for all of you off-site, there may be uh, from similar resources in uh, Dallas and San Antonio, but I'm not familiar with those. So Families Can is a resource here at the U of H, and Shelley Townsend is the social worker that runs that program. And they have lots of different resources, seminars, and that sort of thing that you may find helpful as you're you know, going through this transition process. Another part of that is there's a transition work group that meets the third Thursday of the month at the Shriners Hospital in the Medical Center. It's free parking, everything's free. They have different speakers talking about SSI, um, all sorts of, of information. Um, it's parents of, you know, 
adolescents with multiple different types of disabilities. It's not just epilepsy. So you, yeah, it'll be a group of uh, a, a quite a diverse group with diverse needs. But um, I attended that for a while and periodically attend that. I, I thought it was a good work group that uh, was helpful and, and shared information. The way that you can find out about that transition work group and maybe get on their mailing list or your, their email list is to contact Shelly Townsend. She's a, in, again in charge of that and she sends out flyers um, every month to say what the topic is. So, you know, not every topic might be uh, of interest to you, but if you're interested in that, that's another resource here in the Houston area. I talk too much. Um, <clears throat> I'm almost done, I think. So, uh, as you make that change, you need to ask your current provider to send a copy of the medical records. And it's also helpful if they'll send like a summary letter. Because for those of you who've been dealing with epilepsy for 14, 15, 18 years, your medical record is like this. There's no way anybody's going to read all of that. So if you can get your current provider to put in a one to two page summary that says what what they've been on, kind of where the last MRI was, the results, and kind of what their plans are for treatment, then that can be helpful for the person coming on so that they get a, a little snapshot of who your adolescent is, where they've been, and what they've been doing. Schedule the appointment. Make sure, I recommend that you call that new provider's office before their first visit to make sure they've received those records because I've had several families show up and then they say, oh, well, we didn't get your records, we're not going to see you today. And you don't want that to happen. Um, and then the, the end of it, the completing, and I think that oftentimes this is the piece that doesn't get done, but um, the share back with your pediatric provider what was it by, to make them, we're aware that you actually were successful in making that leap over to the adult world. And you can do that with a last clinic visit or just phone to say, thanks, I made this, I like this new provider, or you know what, I don't like this new person. Can you help, find, help me find another one that maybe is a better fit for me? Share what was helpful in the transition uh, process and what didn't work so that we know how to improve. That's, uh, there's a lot of work being done in this area. There's no real good model that we found yet to know what's the best way to go about doing this. So in summary, transition is a process. We need to start early because it takes time to learn self-advocacy and self-management skills. Really think about this as a journey of advocacy. Actually, I learned that from parents was my dissertation, my PhD dissertation was on transitioning adolescents with epilepsy and intellectual disabilities. And I really found out from talking to parents that this really is a journey of ad advocacy. And you've been on this journey since your, uh, your child started having epilepsy. And it's a continued journey uh, with the goal to maximize lifelong potential. So the end and any questions? Anybody have any questions in the room, and we'll see um, what pops up on the on the screen. In case of emergency. Okay, so you can put healthcare information in there, like your epilepsy medicines that your youth is on. Even if you have a lot, yeah, there's a button for an emergency. Yeah. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Right. So again, that might be something that you might want to put on your youth's phone so that, again, if they're at the movies or where they're <coughs> on with their friends and there's an emergency, somebody can get their phone and they know how to contact you or whatever you've programmed in there that you want them to contact. Maybe what hospital you want them to take them to if they need to go to the hospital. Yep, 
questions on line right now. Do you guys have any other questions in in the room? I don't have a question. I just want to make a statement. When you you mentioned that you sometimes do referrals, you refer them on to um, adult neurologists. Do you ever um, specifically have a discussion about um, epileptologists epi versus Epileptologist versus a, and a general adult neurologist. Yeah, so the question was, as uh, I transition adolescents and make those referrals, do I look specifically for an epileptologist, so a person that specializes in, in epilepsy or just an adult neurologist? I, uh, since I work in the epilepsy, uh, kind of considered in that one of the epilepsy specialists, I usually uh, will refer the kiddos over to another epileptologist. However, if I have an adolescent that has well-controlled seizures and they've been well-controlled, they don't have VNS, they're not on a ketogenic diet, then, you know, again, depending upon where they're going, if they're going off to college or where we're trying to find that, you know, an adult neurologist may be um, adequate. And you know, there's lots of variation among those adult neurologists. Some of them are going to know, be a lot more knowledgeable about epilepsy than others. So, I guess there's a discussion between you and the parent. Right. And actually, young as well. Or right. What do you feel about the parents not letting go, right? Right. Yeah, they're kidding. What do you consider the parent? Exactly. Uh, and being that you're from the Houston area, are you familiar with Dr. Todd Maybell that's located at UTV in Galveston? Yes. Okay, great. That's why I just want to go there. Yeah. That. We work in partnership with him with our Galveston group. Um, we have a support group in Galveston. Maybe you need to come members. up here so they can hear you better. Okay. The other people. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just want to make sure that you um, are aware. He's done wonderful things for our group members to have. Um, Epilepsy on the right. And so for those of you um, that maybe didn't hear that, so you know, just asking what my awareness of other adult epileptologists, and that's good to know. I don't know, obviously don't know everyone, but that's again part of this networking and who do you know and who's been good for you and the Epilepsy Foundation. So I'm sorry, I don't know you, but it seems like you're part of the Epilepsy Foundation. We might be. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's where the Epilepsy Foundation can be a great resource to reach out because the Epilepsy Foundation, so many uh, fingers out across Texas and even, you know, Epilepsy Foundation is in other states as well. So if you're, your adolescent is moving out of state, the Epilepsy Foundation in that state or that area might be a good resource for you. What uh, epilepsy respond the best in the ketogenic diet? So ketogenic diet is, um, you may know, but for those who don't, high fat, very low carbohydrate and adequate proteins. So any type of, we use that to treat any type of epilepsy. It's very difficult though for uh, youth and adolescents who eat everything by, uh, eat all their food by mouth to be on that diet because it is like a strict ketogenic diet is 90% fat and about 10% and well and then 10% carbohydrate plus protein. So it's very, very, you know, none of these donuts that orange juice, nothing here would be, you know. So I there are other types of high fat diet therapy other than the strict ketogenic diet. So there's a <laughs> low glycemic index treatment and there's modified Atkins diet. So those are both high in fat, but not as high fat as the ketogenic diet. And so I'll tend to use those more in adolescents or children that are eating everything by mouth because they're more palatable and give you a little bit more leeway in what you can eat. And still, uh, yeah, and still, yeah, maybe they're not quite as effective. Although some of the studies that have been done, and all the studies have small sample sizes, but if you pool the data, you get a little bit better uh, sample size. And you know, they're 50% uh, reduction in seizures, so, you know, it can be as good as any of our medicines. But it's a lot more difficult because it's very strict and regimented. You can't go to, for any of them, you can't go to McDonald's, you can't 
just go out and hang out and get a Coke or French fries and stuff. So it really becomes a challenge for the adolescent. We've been trying to get our daughter to get into that. Before, so <laughs> yeah, I tried to get the audit fight. I wasn't part of the first sugar craving to be just like that. Well, <laughs> well, exactly, because a banana is really high in carbohydrates, so if you're on the ketogenic diet, you might have a sliver, a half-inch sliver of banana, and that's your carbohydrate for your meal. So, to me, that's meat, but, <laughs> but I'm carbs, that's what I live on. So. Do you not really recommend it for adults? You know, so there, um, you can do it, and there are adults that have done it. My challenge here in Houston, and uh, many areas have the same challenge, but I can't really speak to San Antonio and Dallas, so <coughs> I know that we have those groups on online. Here in Houston, there's really not a um, neurologist or epi adult epileptologist that has an adult ketogenic diet program. So that actually is one of my challenges is I'm transitioning these adolescents and youth is that I'm keeping them longer and longer, 21 or whenever, because I don't have anybody that I can hand them off to. Mm -hmm. So these are mainly kids, though, that um, are not eating everything by mouth or have some intellectual disabilities. Right. We did it. Uh, one time last year, she was in ketosis. We were doing the drug mm -hmm. testing. Uh, she had a seizure during that, so that's been kind of a bad yeah. point. So is, is being in ketosis not the, the symbol that, that it's going to work? Yeah, so um, ketosis, we know that the ketogenic diet or high-fat diet therapies, keto, ketones and spilling ketones in your urine is one of the mechanisms by which it works, but it's probably other things as, as along with ketones. And so, again, kids that I have on low glycemic or modified Atkins, they usually don't spill as many ketones in the urine as on a um, strict ketogenic diet. Sometimes it's enough, though, that'll get seizures under control. Other times it's not. So I kind of the analogy I kind of use is with medications. I mean, so for, for some medications, you can seizures are controlled on a low dose. Others, it takes you a high dose to get them on control. So I kind of think about that the same way. Um, so I know, hi, everybody. It's Rebecca. Rebecca and Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and end the, uh, the webinar here because I know in San Antonio and Dallas, you guys have some things to do there in your class as well. Just a reminder that our next um, transition education program will be March the 5th. And we do have a webinar coming up this um, Thursday. And it's uh, managing, managing your school team. And um, Lisa Blackman, who is the head nurse for Houston ISD, will be giving that webinar. Um, so I definitely encourage you guys to um, join that webinar. Um, it won't be like a live class like this. It'll be a, just a regular webinar with, with Lisa and the PowerPoint. Um, and so please join that webinar and, and get some information. Um, she's not just going to be talking about Houston ISD. She's going to be talking about school teams in general. So um, like I said before, if you're joining us, not from the education uh, programs in uh, San Antonio and Dallas, there'll be an evaluation that pops up at the end. Please fill that out and um, help us know what you thought about this webinar. And we'll join you again next month. Thanks so much. <laughs>